So we're going to be g- finishing up chapter 11 of Hebrews. Uh, we're not going to get into chapter 12 because there's a series of other things we need to answer and look at. Um, and so we're just going to do the two verses. Uh, so just by way of review, chapter 10 was talking about, hey, you know, move on in, f- in faith. And then chapter 11, pretty much the whole thing, but one, verses 1 through 38 talks about this is faith. It's kind of defining what, what faith is. But rather than giving us a dictionary definition of, of what is faith, it gives us what is faith by giving us examples of what faith is. So um, when, when chapter 11 starts off and it talks about faith, it's not, tr- it's not even attempting to give a blanket statement of this is a complete theological definition of faith. I know a lot of times you hear people kind of use ch- Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 like it's trying to give a complete definition. It's not. So don't, don't, try, to <laughs> don't try and make that um, mean more than it means in the context of chapter 11 of Hebrews. So uh, and before we get to the verses, there's a series of questions, and we're going to ask some questions afterwards. But the first one that I want to look at, it takes us all the way back to verse 1 of chapter 11, it's, and this is the basic question. What does it mean that faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen? What does that actually mean? Like, if you just stop and think about it, it's kind of confusing. You know what I mean? Uh and, and so I think that, th- that we could kind of clarify a few things before we actually answer the question. And the first thing to clarify is he is not saying faith is the reality of things that are not. Because sometimes, especially like in the, in the wealth and prosperity and, and all, those, all those kinds of teachings, uh, the naming and claiming, the declaring, all those different ones, they, 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 they talk about it like if you have enough faith, you can declare something that is not as though it is, and it, becomes, and it comes into existence. I, that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, a, and a branch off of this, of this belief is actually that you can't say my disease or my sickness because you're claiming it to yourself. N- no. In fact, all throughout the Bible, we see different examples of people admitting to God that they have an issue, and that's how they find healing or forgiveness when they confess that to God. All throughout the Bible, we never see the example of hiding it from God and not claiming it for yourself. It's, it's not a biblical concept. Uh, and so a lot of times, this whole idea of, of what is faith, they take this one verse out of context, and then they really push it in that it is, you know, y- y- it's the reality of things that are not. And it's not that. Rather, th- it, it, we're talking about things that are. If you go back in your Bible and read chapter 11, verse 1, it's faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen but does still exist, things that are, even though they might not be seen or received just yet. So faith is more than, uh, faith is more than simple belief. For instance, you can't say, well, it's true because I believe it. How do you know that, that, that this whole religion, this whole thing, how do you know it's not just a load? How do you know that the Bible's true? How do you know that, that, that Jesus is real, that he's God? How, and a lot of times people say this, well, I just believe. We don't have an irrational faith system. It's not like we had to believe something where there's no proof, like in Mormonism, right, where you just have to believe me that this angel really did give me these secret tablets, and it really did have this language that is unknown to man except for me. Like, you don't have to just go out on this limb here. Christianity is well backed up by things, like, for instance, the Israelites in the wilderness. The Passover is something that has a historical basis. The empty tomb, like there, there's historical details and facts that make Christianity um, reasonable. And it's more than just simple belief. And I think that w- as we go through, as we've gone through chapter 11, we definitely see uh, the example of faith being more than just a belief. Th- th- these people had confidence, which is more than just belief, and I'll get to that in just a minute. And then that confidence spurred them on to action. So how is faith reality? Um, First off, these are things that are, even though they might not yet be received or seen, something that may be in the future or maybe in the spiritual. Now, I want to flip to three different examples of how different translations read this or translate this. And I'll start with the NIV because I think it's, it's really good if this is what you think it's trying to say in the original. So... We'll just start with that. The NIV reads this. Faith is the confidence of things hoped for. So it says it is confidence and the assurance of things not seen. So in the NIV, the idea is basically um, it's more of maybe an emotional thing or a a mental mindset maybe. You are confident of something. You're assured of something. It's all there. 
Um, so the confidence of things hoped for, assurance of things not seen. And those things not seen, once again, those can be future things, like things that are coming but are not yet, or they can be spiritual things. Uh, you know, sometimes things might look, for instance, like God's not in control. When he is in control, that would be like a spiritual reality. Um, and the chapter definitely does clarify. Once again, when you, when you look through chapter 11, I think a lot of times we kind of break parts up. Verse 1 sets up the rest of the chapter, and we've looked at those over the past, like, two or three weeks now. And so the rest of the chapter is explaining what verse 1's definition of faith means. So if the NIV is correct, the main focus then is being firm in what God has said. The, the main focus of, of, verse, of verse 1 is to, to, to be firm in what God has said. So it's more focused on your response to God, not so much God himself. Then the NASB, it kind of mixes things. It, it kind of... I guess you could call it mixing the metaphors. It, it kind of switches between the two um, ideas. Faith is the certainty, the certain, I'm sorry, I, I, I mistyped that. I Hold on. Sorry about that, guys. I mistyped it. So in the NASB, it says, now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. So it kind of mixes the metaphors. It, and the first part says faith is a certainty of things, so we're talking more mental or emotional. And it says a proof of things, so that's more of, you know, evidence-based, more, you know, physical. You know, so it kind of mixes the two. Whereas if you hop over to the um, the King James Version, it goes to the other extreme that the, that the NIV does. And other, other translations will say this too. It says faith is a substance, the evidence. See, in the King James, it's not focused on that mental part of being assured or confident. It's more focused on the physical part of a substance, something tangible, something that it's evidence. You know, like, hey, I have a car. Well, how do you know? This is my title. Yeah, I can show you the title for my car. That would be like kind of like what the KJV is saying. So um, whether you say it's substance or reality or the title, whatever you want to call it, it's the, it's, the, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But wh- what does that really mean, right? So the focus in the King James would be what God has said is so sure that faith is the reception of it, right? Faith is receiving what God has said because it's so sure. Even when it hasn't been received yet, it's as though it has been received. So for instance, Abraham had faith. So it was like he received the promise of the children even though he didn't get to see the children. See what I'm saying? He didn't get to live to see Israel become a whole nation. But he accepted in faith, and so because he had that faith, it was like he had received it. Um, and then another way of saying that, and I've actually put this on the slide somewhere. So how is faith reality? It's things that are, and it's also as if it was received. But if you go to um, slide 13, and I'll get to it in just a minute, Grace. So you could say it like this. Faith is such a confident response to God that it is as though you already have received those promises you are looking forward to but haven't yet received. So I I know that's kind of wordy, but I wanted to kind of really clarify what's really being said here. And so some people might say, well, faith, so so then faith is the proof that there is something to have proof about? That sounds like just a circle of nonsense. Well, no, that's not, not, no, no, no. It is a confident response to what God has said. So God has said something, that's the basis of the faith, and the faith is the response to that. So because I have faith in God, I won't give up in this trial. That's what it would look like in your, in your life. This is what the application of verse 1 would be. Because I have faith in God, I won't give up in this trial. I know what is coming, and I will act thusly. All right? So even though I might be going through cancer treatments, I know what's coming in heaven. I know what waits for me, so I'm going to endure this. I'm not going to give up because I, I know what's coming. So this is how I'm going to act. And faith, all throughout, all throughout chapter 11, faith is shown as an action. It's, it's shown as something that has legs to it. So we have those three things of how is faith real, reality. Things that are but not yet received, as, as if it was received, and it is a confident response. So now that takes us to a second question that kind of switch gears here. Um, well, I guess I should wait real quick. Any questions on what I just said about kind of explaining verse 1? Uh, so that takes us to the second question I want to look at before we get to verse 39. Why does God do this with faith? Why does God do this whole 
testing our faith thing. It's kind of annoying sometimes. So why, why, does, why does he do it? I mean, he's obviously not just trying to irritate us, you know. You guys got any ideas here? I thought you were saying something, Jason. I guess you. Uh, I gotcha. I gotcha. So why does God do this with faith, this whole testing our faith thing? Why not just leave it alone? <laughs> Was that? Absolutely. Absolutely. But can you elaborate a little bit? Right. Like, explain what you mean. So it gives you compassion, empathy, experience, okay? And then it, it, it um, grows your faith, okay? Great, absolutely great. Anything else? Somebody raised their hand here. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Absolutely. It shifts your faith, absolutely. Because and, and and building on that, you know, I have noticed that when God kind of leaves me alone, I kind of get naturally very self-focused, and you know, I just don't really trust in God that much. <laughs> you know, maybe maybe it's just me. <laughs> uh, any anybody else? Okay, so. There's something that I took from Bill Gothard. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him, but he used to be pretty popular back in probably like the, I don't know, like 80s, I guess. Uh, and he had this book that he did with some of his seminars. It's called The Institute in Basic Youth Conflict. Um, I don't know if you can, like, find it online or anything, but he used to have it at the conferences. And um, he talks about this very thing, and he talks about the way that how God uses us as an opportunity to make us more like Christ. And so he's not really concerned primarily as to how happy we are that he's doing that. He's more concerned with making us more like Christ. And uh, so we see a pattern that kind of repeats itself uh, throughout Scripture. And I have a chart here on, on the thing that we're going to show. And this is from Bill Gothard. It's not like I came up with this, okay? Uh, but so basically there's a, an example, there, there's kind of a pattern in the Bible that God gives a vision and then there's a death of that vision and then there's some kind of a fulfillment of the vision which is usually a supernatural fulfillment, okay? So just by way of example, we'll, we'll go through th three here. Um, the first is Abraham, right? So Abraham will become a nation. That's the vision, right? But then there's the death of the vision. Uh, Sarah is barren. She can't have kids, so this isn't looking very good. And also, on top of that, even when he did have a kid, he had to sacrifice that kid. So you see a lot of like uh, a lot of things that aren't really working out for his his you know favor or for his whatever you want to say his 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 vision working out. But then you have a supernatural fulfillment of the vision where God does give the son of the promise, and you know he grows up healthy, has his own family, and the promise continu continues on. Um, a second example would be wheat, the, the plant, not like, not, I'm not talking about like a, a parable or anything, but wheat, you know, you, you, you get the wheat and then before you plant it, it dies. So that would be like the death of a vision. You know, this wheat seed, this wheat kernel has, has a vision of being mighty <laughs> and then it dies and then it's buried under the ground where it's dead. And then it is resurrected from the dead. The wheat springs up and you have a filled of wheat. It's how the, it's wired into the world we live in. And then a third example would be Joseph. Joseph had this vision of becoming a leader. It was not his own vision. It was God's vision. But he had this vision of becoming a leader. 
And then he had the death of a vision, which was, you know, he was sold <laughs> into slavery by his brothers who were not big fans of him. Uh, they were not part of the uh, mailing list. You know, <laughs> how missionaries come in and they say, hey, if you want to receive the newsletter, they did not want to receive the newsletter. Uh, and so, it, you know, he's kind of a lot of issues there. And then, lo and behold, Joseph just happens to get this opportunity to interpret a dream, and Pharaoh promotes him to ruler. And, um, well, I shouldn't say, it's not the top ruler, but you know what I'm saying. So we have, in all these three examples, we have people, uh, situations, I should say, where there was a vision, the death of the vision, and then a supernatural fulfillment. And God typically does this. And um, we're going get to the, get to this in just a minute, as, that, how, as far as that applies to us. But there's one more thing I want to say. But as God does this, um, and you see it really repeated all throughout Scripture. As God does this, you, you, you definitely see that basically it's like a hammer and chisel that God is working character to us and bringing us into shape. And he does this in, in very painful ways. Um, I think one of the ways, one of the reasons why it has to be painful is because if we don't care, it's not going to do much for us. You know, you know like I give the example, or I have given the example numerous times where you know, there's people dying all the time, right? Around the world right now, there's people dying all the time. We don't really care. I mean, like, don't hear what I'm saying. Like, we're not crying about it. But if it's somebody that we know personally and love, that one person who dies, it's a big deal to us. It's a big deal. Well, you know, what, what made the difference? It was personal. It's personal. So God can u- speak to us in personal situations that he can't oftentimes in situations that aren't personal. So God plays a role in the scenario that requires faith. In all these examples, things have to have to require faith. So what we're going to do is um, take just a few minutes. I'm going to give you just a couple minutes. And I want you to think in your own life something that God gave you a vision for. It can be anything. We're not sharing this. This is something just for you. If you have a piece of paper, I highly encourage you to write down a, a chart like this. And if you can even think of one or two different things. We're just going to take a few minutes here. And I want you to think of different visions that God has given to you. Now, they don't have to be like visions, visions, like, you know, I saw. It, not like that. I mean, like, um, something that, that you wanted to see happen, you know, uh, a vision of something. Like for Abraham, his vision wasn't like a dream or anything. It was God saying, hey, you're going to be a nation. So, uh, yeah. And then uh, write down next to that the death of the vision, something that happened that made it where the vision seems like it's never going to happen. It's just never going to happen. Uh, and then r- write down, if you, this might not apply to you yet, if it does apply, write down the fulfillment of the vision. If it doesn't apply, I'll leave it open-ended because <laughs> you obviously might not live to see it fulfilled, but that doesn't mean it won't be fulfilled. And if you if you need one more example, I'll give the example of my mom. So God wanted all uh, God mom wanted all of mom's kid mom wanted all of her kids to serve God. That's what I'm trying to say. And half of them ended up leaving the faith. And uh, and even when she died, she never saw all of her kids saved. And so that story is unfinished. But you definitely see the vision that her kids would be saved and love the Lord. The death of the vision, over half of them ended up leaving the faith. And then still waiting on that supernatural fulfillment. So just take a couple seconds, minutes, I should say. If you can't think of anything right now, um, Come back to it tonight or tomorrow. Hopefully you were able to write something down there. Um, if you don't feel like you've ever had a vision for something that God wanted to do in your life, 
um, now is a perfect time to start praying and asking God to give you one. Um, we are starting a new series on Sundays about uh, the, the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at all kinds of different things with the Holy Spirit. And this is a perfect time to, um, you know, to start praying that, you know, God leads you in a new direction, shows you something new. So in the example of my mom that I gave you, um, you know, maybe, maybe all of her kids will never get saved. I don't know. I'm not God. But I do know that maybe, well, I, I know that God can fulfill visions in more than the ways than we anticipate them being fulfilled. So I'll give you an example. Maybe other people that mom were kind of affected, maybe they get saved and she becomes kind of like a spiritual mom to them. And when she when they get to heaven, they, they see her there and it's because of her. You never know. And so it wouldn't have been her biological children, but it doesn't mean that it returned void. So there's m- no multiple ways that visions can get fulfilled. So as you as you write these things down, and remember once again, I want to encourage you, if you haven't done this, if you didn't do this, if you didn't participate, do it sometime in the next couple of days. And keep that in the back of your Bible so that when times come and it seems like things are just falling apart, you can remind yourself of God's process of growing faith in you and growing character into you, even when it's painful, even when it doesn't make sense. Things that just keep you going when you don't feel like going um, anymore. So visions won't always come true. There's going to be some things in your life that, that you really wanted to see happen and they, and they never happen. So visions aren't all, all always going to come, come true. It's not like you go to a conference one time, they get you excited and you write something down and because you wrote it down, it, it happens. Like It's not always going to work like that. A lot of times visions aren't going to come true, uh, especially just because you wanted to. It has to be a vision from God. And there's a huge difference between getting a dream or a vision of something and a vision or dream of something from God. So dreams and visions, it can, it's oftentimes something you're born with, right? Something that it's just, you, you have this desire in you to see it happen. You know what I mean? It's not always that way, but sometimes it is. And so you're going to see, a lot of them aren't going to seem very spiritual to you. It's going to be something like, man, I just, I just have this dream to, to adopt a child. I, I just have this dream to, you know, um, help fund a new church plant in Africa. I just have this dream to... It, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be something that that you you have to be in the spotlight and you know this big thing, but as long as it's something that is placed in you from God. So now we can get get to verses thirty nine through forty. Like I said, it's not a whole big section to read. Um, uh, Melissa, I didn't have you. Uh, no, did I have you? No, I didn't. Can you read this? All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. So these verses, when I read them, and I reread them, and I reread them, and they just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. <laughs> like, you would think that this would be the easiest part of, of the whole thing, just kind of like summarizing itself, but it really confused me. And so th- there's, I think if we just break it down, it's really only verse 40 that's, that's confusing. Verse 39 says, All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised. So God commanded, commended himself for their faithfulness. So this, uh, all these were approved through their faith, approved by God. Some of the, some of the different translations say maybe commended by God. So the, uh, Im- imagine the, the immensity of this. God himself commended them for their faithfulness. That's an amazing thing. And... Uh, then we get to the second part of this verse, and it says they did not receive what was promised. Now, what does it mean that they didn't receive? Because, yeah, actually, some of them received certain promises. Absolutely. We, we, we went, we've just gotten through from reading chapter 11. A lot of them received the, the promises. What is he talking about that they did not receive the promise when some of them did receive the promise? Well, what he's talking about, he's more talking about a blanket term. They didn't receive the full conclusion of it. The, 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 the totality of, of it. They, they, they didn't receive the complete, the fulfillness, I'm mean, sorry, the fullness of the promise. Um, so he's more talking about in absolute terms. So yeah, uh, some of them may have, for instance, inherited the land or inherited children or whatever, but excuse me, they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, see the Christ and, you know, have that whole thing, right? So obviously they do now, which takes us to verse 40. And it says, since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. And this is the part where it gets a little bit confusing. 
<laughs> what does that mean? Well, <laughs> it, it's, not as, it's not as confusing as it sounds. Basically, they didn't receive the Christ, but now he has come, and we are all united in that perfection. So they were waiting for him to be revealed. He has been revealed for us, and they were included in that. Okay, So they were waiting <laughs> waiting for that, and now they received that. So, so two things about this. First off, that tells us that there's only ever been one way. Even before Jesus came, there was never any other way. Um, a lot of times people have this question over and over again. Where, what happened to people before Jesus uh, came and died and all that? What, what happened to those people? Same thing that happens to us. <laughs> they lived by faith or they didn't live by faith. It's the exact same thing. Uh, they were just looking forward to the Christ. We look back to the Christ. Um, so there's only, always only ever been one way. Works never save people. Sacrifice never save people. In fact, I had this explosion moment uh, today. I was, I was reading in the law. And did you know that when the law was, okay, so when, when people messed up and they had to come, to come before God with a sacrifice and all that, they never once had to have a commitment that they wouldn't do that thing again. And when they sacrificed, the sacrifice was not a commitment for the future. It was because of what had already happened in the past. I have messed up. Here's a sacrifice, right? That didn't change with the new, te- with the new covenant. That absolutely did not change. We, we mess up. We go before God. Lord, forgive me. That's it. It's not all do better. It's not all try to do this. It's not, you know... <laughs> <laughs> that's us adding our own uh, nonsense to that. So then the second thing, so the first one, there's always, always only been one way, but the second thing, those from before their faith was, uh, before, before Jesus, their faith was attributed as righteousness. So they looked forward, and that was granted to them as righteousness. So it, it's not a, ra- it sounds like what the Bible is saying is that the righteousness is of their own, but no, no, no. The faith was their own, and then God rewarded their faith, and that was as the righteousness. So just so we're on the same page here. Um, so they now have received the promise that they were waiting for, which is the promise that we have received. They did not have to get resaved. The dead people did not have to get resaved. They didn't <laughs> have to do that or, or have a new offer given after death. Absolutely not. The Bible is absolutely clear. Ooh, there is appointed to man once to die. It's not. It is now appointed for man once to die. It is appointed man wants to die. So, <clears throat> the question then becomes that I, that I hear people ask, when, especially with verses like this where it's talking about, you know, receiving the perfection, all these different things. Wh- what if I'm still sinning? What if I'm still doing the same thing that I've done a hundred times? Uh, I got saved and I'm still doing the same stupid thing. Let me ease your conscience. You are still sinning. <laughs> what a liberating thing. Repentance, eh. here's the thing about repentance. R- repentance is a conundrum. It's a paradox, and this is why. R- to repent is to turn from sin, right? We all know that. But we really can't turn from sin on our own, can we? We can turn to God, or, uh, it, well, not even, well, yes. We can turn to God more or less on our own, but we can't, <laughs> we can't turn ourselves from the sin, if we could, we wouldn't need Jesus. I mean, we'd only need him for what was already done, but we still need him for now for what will come. It's not like a one-and-done sacrifice. So whenever we sin, the idea here is, is basically you sin, okay? It's not okay. We're not giving a free pass to sin, but when you sin, keep trusting in God. Lord, please forgive me. Um, especially I find this, I uh, hope this doesn't make anybody uncomfortable. I, f- I hear this like so many times, especially from young men who are addicted to certain sexual things, if you understand what I'm saying. Because uh, they go through the same thing of, you know, oh, well, I... I I repented and I asked God for forgiveness and I did it again. You know, I'll do better next time. And you know, you know. and so then it starts kind of weigh on them. You know, and uh, it's never. It, it's frustrating if you keep messing up with the same thing. And there is obviously a point on, on some things where God frees you from something and you kind of go back to it on your own. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where it's 
it, it's a choice that you made sometimes where it's like, well, yeah, I could have done that, but I didn't, though. <laughs> like, yeah, God freed me from my anger, but it felt good just to lash out that one time. <laughs> I didn't mean, I'm not thinking of you when I said that. Uh, I'm not thinking of Melissa Waltmeyer when I said that. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You, you remember, you remember back when, when people used to, you know, get their mail read and, oh my goodness, that was so uncomfortable. <laughs> Anyways, I'm getting off track. So back on topic. Topic. So we're not trying to try harder because basically we're saying when we say when we tell ourselves I'm going to try harder next time and there's actually verses that we're going to look at in the future not now but in the future uh, that, that people kind of misquote but the Bible is very clear that when we come to God in repentance we don't have to like try harder that's not the idea because basically God is doing the work we are not saved through works and if we're trying harder then that means we're trying to earn our salvation. You have choices, and you aren't forced to do evil, but the struggle will remain. So the last thing I want to look at before we close out tonight is two huge pitfalls whenever we read Hebrews chapter 11. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Chances are one of these two pitfalls is going to apply to you. The first one is I'm just not as good as them. These people in the Bible, they were really good. They had their act together. They were worth emulating. They're in the Bible, for goodness sakes. That's just not me. Uh, and I understand the point. Uh, it even seems like you, you know, um, humility, but it's not. It's not. Well, all that it really is is another form of pride. It's where you're focusing on your own terribleness, which is pride. You're focusing on you. <laughs> Anytime you are focusing on you, whether the result is happiness or sadness, it's still pride. Like it's, it's the, the problem is, is when we put ourselves as the primary character. So, yes, here's the thing. Well, the, I'm not as good as these people. They were heroes. Here's the thing, though. They were flawed, and they made mistakes, just like us. In fact, I brought up last week the different people that he was saying these great things about. From our perspective, it almost seems like everything that they did was wrong. These aren't like people of faith. Like That means that they were people of perfection and flawlessness. They were people of faith, which basically looks like you and me. That's what that looks like. And if you go back and read the whole story of the different people who are given us, you know, these hall of faithers, you know, it, it's not quite as glamorous as, as we expect, you know. Um, like, once again, the, the thought that keeps occurring to me is where we read, and one of the few things we hear Sarah saying is when she's laughing <laughs> about God's promise. Ha, that'll never happen. And yet, what does Hebrews 11 say? What a woman of faith. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's not on my list, but okay. <laughs> so they, ref- they responded in faith, absolutely, but they struggled. And I think that that very much so, uh, that's, that's what we do too. We respond in faith sometimes and we struggle and, you know, it's the same thing. Now, what do you mean by that? Okay, I see what you're saying. So so let me say that again just to make sure I got it. You were saying sometimes the response of faith is in the action. And how do you say that? Not so much in the words, but in the action. Yes, okay. Yeah. Now that's... No, no, no. But this is a very good point worth mentioning, worth bringing up. Absolutely. Because, and here's the thing, we talked about this last week, faith is not a feeling, it's not an emotion. Sometimes it will conjure feelings, but that's irrelevant. Faith is not a feeling. And what she just said is, I I think, 110% completely on the mark. Because basically what we're saying is, yes, you can have an emotional outburst without that meaning that your faith was no. You know, and I think that's absolutely worth mentioning, especially in light of Sarah, where her action was still faith, even though the temporary emotion of the moment was still not great. I wanted to make sure we got that so it's on the on the live stream, but I didn't mean to cut you off. So if there's anything else. Yeah, 110. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. No cap. I don't know what that means, but okay. These kids nowadays that they're... Whatever it is that is... I don't know. I, I'm just catching on with the yeet. 
And I think I've used it correctly, you know, yeet or not to yeet. That is the question. I think that's how the kids use it. But, but I've been told they don't use that word anymore. So I guess I'm too late. So we are called to respond in faith even amidst the struggles, the same as in the, the, what if I failed and really messed up? And this is the thing that gets people. I'm okay with responding in faith unless I really mess up. You know what I mean? I really messed up. I messed up maybe even for years I really messed up, and it's just unforgivable. Check it out, though. You respond in faith at that time the same way as before you respond in faith. Even if you think you've really gone over the deep end, you still respond in faith. And you hear people doing this a lot. I'm scared that I may have done the unforgivable sin. Well, you're scared, so you probably didn't. So you should probably respond in faith. I'm scared that when I'm gone, my wife is going to die. I mean, she could. Well, respond in faith. You know, if she does, you know where she's going, hopefully, unless you've married one of them pagan girls. I know. So what action will you take? I, re- I think is really, and going, I think this really builds on what Melissa already said. What action will you take? Um, and and uh, something that's kind of interesting before we get to the second point is, do you notice how some people have actually had it worse than the examples from Hebrews 11? In Christian history, there's actually been some people who had it worse than the biblical examples of faith. That blows me away. So, you know, you, you don't feel too bad about whether you had it easier or harder. It's just not really relevant. So in the second pitfall of Hebrews 11 that I think people come into is misunderstanding faith. And I'm going to give you a couple different examples of what I mean. First off, having faith in my faith. Okay. This is basically if I can conjure a strong enough feeling or emotion. You know, and you see people even go into worship services and trying to really, you know, work themselves up and really you know, whoa, get themselves all excited. They'll go to a conference so they can strengthen their faith. And what they really mean is strengthen their emotion. So if I, if I, if I just believe hard enough, that's not faith. That's not faith. <laughs> the, second, the second example, faith in God's goodness to me. And this is the problem with this one is it sounds very biblical. It sounds biblical, but it's not. It's not faith in God's goodness. It's faith in God's goodness to me. Let me kind of elaborate on this one because it might confuse you with how I said how I worded that. Um, since God is good, that's a true statement. Everything He does is good. That's an iffy statement because all good comes from God, but it doesn't say that nothing but good comes from God. So you're in a gray area right now. And so everything He is, everything He does is good, and He will only work good for me. Ah. And this is definitely a false statement. See, we started on a positive, then we got into very murky areas, and then we got into dark, not true areas. And so it sounds good, and you're going to hear a lot of Christian speakers talk about stuff like this, and it's going to sound really good and really exciting, but it's just not, it's not true, it's not biblical. Because there's a few things. First off, God's going to bring by trials. First thing, God will bring by trials. And this isn't just the thing that Satan does or people does. God will bring by trials. That's the first thing. In fact, that whole thing about considering it all joy, he talks about trials. So read all of James 1, and you start to see the kind of, uh, uh, not duplicity, but the two-pronged bit of this. Uh, so the, God brings by uh, trial, trials, but then also there's punishment that God brings by. And punishment from God that does not always mean that you did something wrong. Sometimes God brings by punishment to bring up your faith, not to punish you for something you did wrong. And we're going to actually, that's the next section of Hebrews. Read forward in the, throughout the week, read in cha- Hebrews chapter 12, and you're going to see he's going to start talking about the punishment of God. And how can you punish someone who's not even guilty? So then we get to the third thing. So, so trials, punishment, temptation. God sometimes allows us to be tempted, and sometimes God leads us towards things that bring temptation. Sometimes God guides our feet towards that because he knows what we need or because of hardness or stubbornness in us. And this is a whole long conversation I wish we had more time for, but I just want to lay out the idea. So the idea is this. What if he doesn't do that thing? Well, God's good. I trust him. What if he doesn't save your marriage? What if he doesn't get your kids saved? What if he doesn't bring you a job? What if he doesn't uh, help you get out of debt? What if all those things, no. What if the answer is no on all of them? See, and now we've got a problem. And so faith is not God is go- God's goodness to me. Faith is God's goodness. Big difference. Right. Right. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Don't get so blindsided on the first, I mean, on the temporary. Faith is also not a creed. I'm sorry. Yes. The example, uh, people have the idea that faith is a creed, so faith is not a creed. Um, so a good example of this is where people think, if I just, it's just all about, it's like where Christianity has turned into nothing but a mental exercise. Nothing but, you know, a logical thing. So either it's, belie- it's a set of beliefs or a mental exercise you go through or a statement that you make. Right? But faith isn't just a statement that I'm making, you know. Uh, faith is, a, is not a blind leap. So what that means and oftentimes people make the misunderstanding, and I mention this quite a few times because it irritates me so bad, that, that religion, all religion, basically there's no evidence and you're just going because you don't know what else. I don't know why the world works like it does, therefore God. And that's absolutely not true. I mean, it might be true of some religions. It's definitely not true of Christianity. Um, and, but the idea here is without any evidence, believing because I believe. It's like a Disney movie. But that's not faith. Faith, faith is very much a we- reasonable. When, and I want you to remember this. I even wrote it on the screen somewhere. Uh, when God has you step in, out into the unknown, that is based off of the known. When God moves you into a place in your life that is unknown, he's going to base it off of the known and take you there. Okay? It's going to be something, things that happen in your past. You, you're, you're already existent faith in God. You already know about Jesus' resurrection. You already have that firm. And he's going to move you into the unknown. Things like, okay, I want you to trust me with what's going on with your spouse's health, your, your parents' health, your kids' health. I mean, especially kids' health. That one's hard. Um, you know, I want you to trust me with this. It's like, oh, that's hard. Yes, but it's based off of the known in your life. I'm taking you into the unknown, yes, but it's based off the known. When God has you step out into the unknown, that is based off the known. And I want to just mention this very briefly. Th- there's oftentimes this example given of doubting Thomas, Right? He's, you know, so evil and bad. Here's the thing. That verse, th- those verses are oftentimes kind of used as a weapon to assault wisdom and knowledge that basically um, you should never have any certainty and just kind of. And that's definitely not what the whole story of Doubting Thomas has to teach us. We'll come back to that some other day, but no, I just want to mention that. And next, uh, next off, faith I- is not just a posture. And this one is one that our, our culture really trips itself over. Basically, Faith becomes nothing but like uh, a catchphrase. So it's, it can be switched out with being religious or being uh, spiritual. You know, they're a person of deep faith in Buddha, but deep faith. And that's not, not faith. So actually what faith is, faith is confident action as a response to God. Confident action as a response to God. It might start out with you kind of being a little bit shaky in that action. But as you continue to step out into faith, it'll get stronger. Faith is about action. And you're going to have your emotions go crazy. That's fine. You're a human. That's fine. Uh, faith, and, and so then we have a little bit of a, a little bit of a, we need to realize the grace is given us. So faith is given to us by God. And it's made firm by the Holy Spirit. In fact, one of the ways that the Holy Spirit moves in us is by giving us a greater element of faith. It's based on God and what his promises are and who he is. It's affirmed not by our faithfulness, but by God finding good in our mixed results. And they very much so are mixed results. You're going to have some, some things that you just say, oh, I nailed that. And then other things are just going to completely bomb. So God accepts you in the struggles as you lean into him in the struggle. We're getting ready to close this out. Um, but I want to bring up uh, an issue, th- not an issue, but a point from Hebrews 11 as you go through. None of the examples of, of those healing of those faith things all throughout chapter 11, none of them um, had healing. You have offering, moving, building a boat, raising a dead body, but you never hear any of these, and they have whole conferences for this whole, you know, um, healing thing. And, And if you look at these examples, what you see is this. There's no magical formula. That's the first thing you see about faith. It's not like you're going to be able to just learn this, this prayer or this certain thing that you do perfect, and that's going to nail it. And you also see that faith isn't about the situation. It's, it's never about the situation you're in. It applies to many situations. Faith doesn't always bring good results. The outcomes may be messy. They might be bad. They might be good. I mean, think about this. Meshach was thrown into the fire. God decided at that time to save him, but there's a lot of martyrs throughout Christian history that he didn't save. 
faith is also rewarded by God. And the last thing I want to say about faith is when, when we say living by faith, that's basically, it's a response of trusting God. It's a lifestyle. Uh, you could say that that is a posture. And it's not based on a certain promise that God gave you. Okay, like for instance, you're going to get through this, this day alive and nothing bad is going to happen. It's not like he gave you that personal promise. It's based on, I know who God is, and so I'm walking in faith. And something, something comes up, you're afraid, I'm still going to keep trusting God, I'm still going to keep seeking after him. I'm being moved emotionally in fear, but I'm going to keep moving forward. So that's living by faith. Um, and it's just something that we all have to learn as we go through these struggles. So if we summarize verses uh, 39 through 12 too, which we haven't gotten to chapter 12 yet, so don't freak out yet, but uh, move, it's basically moving forward in faith. This is what faith is. This is moving forward in faith. So that will lead us into chapter 12. And then at chapter 12, verse 3, it'll start getting into the whole punishing uh, people who don't deserve it. So uh, are there any questions before we wrap this up?